is Jody Gutkin. I will be your instructor today for hip and knee arthroplasty. To tell you a little bit about myself, I have been a physical therapist for over 25 years. Uh, I graduated back in the baccalaureate days of our profession and have um, had the opportunity in my career to work with uh, PTs, OTs, athletic trainers in a variety of settings. So I look forward to imparting what I've learned with you today. Um, my experience has had me practice, I think, in almost every practice setting from acute care to outpatient private practice um, and in hospitals to the home care setting. Um, I've enjoyed working with adult and pediatric populations throughout that continuum, uh, pediatrics even in the school setting. Uh, and then with uh, my move to Florida from New York, the latter part of my career, I have had the opportunity to work with more geriatric individuals in uh, skilled nursing and rehab settings. My uh, love and passion for all aspects of the profession has taken me into education. So I went back and have a master's in education specializing in online teaching and learning. Lends itself nicely to this delivery format. And I am also a certified ergonomic assessment specialist. So I am a physical therapy uh, educator also in my career. And I, again, look forward to uh, having some nice discussion with you today. There, again, is nothing that you need to do as we go through our webinar. You can just sit back and relax and enjoy our topic today. To tell you a little bit about um, the course before we actually go into it, um, we are looking at hip and knee arthroplasty and it's always troubled me in my career when I hear individuals say, oh, you just work with hips or knees or you only work with total joint replacement patients. They are equally complicated and complex and everyone is very different. Uh, as we go through today, we'll look at um, not only that that idea of osteoarthritis and the prevalence of it, but we're going to really take time and delve more into the surgical procedures and things we need to be aware of based on the surgical procedure that impact our rehabilitation and our outcome of our patients. There are a lot of great courses out there that go over, you know, different types of exercises, soft tissue mobilization and other techniques. So the angle that I took is a little bit different. We're going to spend time talking about what happens surgically and during the um, immediate post uh, surgical procedure in that aspect of time to see how can we minimize complications. What considerations do we have further out during rehab, different presentations of pain and restrictions patients may have that really relate to the surgical procedure. So my goal for today is to have you look at this patient population from a different angle when you're rehabilitating them to really maximize your outcomes uh, and give you some different considerations to have. As we go through that, um, we are going to look at uh, not only the surgical procedure, but the types of anesthetic and pain management, looking at post-operative complications as well as long-term complications we should be aware of, and then our patient education uh, programs and early mobilization of the patient, that role it has ultimately in our outcomes. The way that I create my different courses is it often stems from questions that, you know, arise myself or as I'm working with my students and we get in some great cl clinical debates. I dive into the research to try and answer them. For every course I present, I read about 100 research studies to save you from doing that. Uh, your clinical time is very valuable. So anytime I have a particular study that um, emphasizes a point, I will note that in the presentation, and then all the references are at the end. The studies that I utilize are all available for free, so if you ever wanted to go back and read the full study yourself, you'll be able to find that easily um, on the internet. I don't have any preconceived ideas as I'm developing the course. So with this particular topic, when I thought, well, you know, should we be using the CPM or not? What's the current uh, 
trend. Or, you know, you could line up five different total knee patients, even from the same physician, and write, see three different scar patterns. What's the difference there? How do we answer that question when they have it? Um, for total hips, anterior versus posterior approach. So all of these different questions led me to kind of just dive into the research, and I'll present to you what I found so that then you can make the best clinical decision for your specific patients. As with any course that you attend, just a little disclaimer here that application of the concepts that we present today, uh, you will be applying in accordance with your specific federal, state, and professional regulations when you go back into your uh, practice setting. We can't talk about hip and knee arthroplasty without first discussing arthritis. And the Centers for Disease Control um, published a study in 2016 where over a two-year period they had done uh, tracking on the prevalence and impact of arthritis in our country. And they discovered that 23% of the population over 18 has arthritis as of 2016. That's over 54 million individuals. And we know this because we're seeing these individuals. Um, they delved a little more deeply into this and to look at, okay, just because a patient has a diagnosis of arthritis, how and is that impacting their life and their ability to participate in work and recreational activities? And what they uh, use to define this are called um, arthritis attributable limitations. So they look at things such as um, being able to sit for greater than two hours. Can you walk a quarter mile or climb a flight of stairs? So looking at um, those specific indicators to demonstrate that arthritis is impacting the individual's life and decreasing their ability to participate, they actually found that 44% of individuals with arthritis fall into that category where they have some level of restriction. And that's again impactful for us because you're looking at over 23 million individuals that have some type of functional restriction because of their arthritis. And most of those individuals are falling between that 18 to 64 year old category where they're also trying to work in addition to participate in life. Projecting this forward, they looked at a potential future burden of 78 million individuals by the year 2040 who are impacted by arthritis. Now, this includes all different types of arthritis. There are about 100 different uh, diagnoses that fall under that category. We typically think of osteoarthritis, rheumatoid heart arthritis, but it's also things like um, gout, lupus, and other diagnoses. Osteoarthritis makes up a large portion of these individuals and they're predicting it to increase so significantly because of the obesity epidemic and because as our population is growing, we're still remaining active and have um, expectations of functional mobility. And as I fall into that category, I definitely concur with that. Um, so this impact is important for us to consider when we look at arthritis. As I said, osteoarthritis is the most common, and arthritis is the most common cause of disability in the United States. It's held that title for about 15 years, which is a long period um, of time, and this is despite all the different advances that we do have. They look at, in different states, the distribution of individuals with arthritis, and I thought it was really interesting to find that there were more individuals with arthritis in Maine, Mississippi, and Tennessee. Those were the highest ranking states, whereas California and Florida, where you think of individuals maybe retiring to the sun, actually had lower incidence. Um, can't explain it, but an interesting uh, fact that I came across. Um, and again, one in 25 individuals have those restrictions that are limiting their functional mobility. And as clinicians, we're forward thinking to realize that if someone has a restriction in their functional mobility, that places them at greater risk of falling two and a half times actually because of having a diagnosis of arthritis and then for other sequela. So the impact of arthritis is not only on function for individuals in the working population, and also has a significant cost and financial uh, burden on society. And um, arthritis is the second most expensive condition treated in hospitals. 
that is totaling around um, $16 billion. That is a lot of money. And for private pay, it incorporates uh, the highest amount of the payouts that are occurring for private pay. When we think about this as clinicians, what does the data actually mean? What we should consider is that um, osteoarthritis is more expensive in terms of hospitalizations than live births in the uh, year. So what's happening is these individuals that are going in for their surgical procedure to improve their function and have a better quality of life, something must be happening. And what happens is there tends to be a loop sometimes where the individual has complications and then they have a readmit to the hospital. So that makes it um, a prolonged rehab, not as strong of an outcome, and again, more expensive. Comorbidities play a significant role. And in all of our disciplines, PTOT and athletic training, we're looking at our patients holistically, which I can tell you is definitely a shift from when I was you know training 30 years ago um, we were treating a little hip or knee that kind of wobbled into the clinic and over time it's been great to see that well the individual looking specifically at osteoarthritis half of the individuals have heart heart disease half have diabetes a third are also obese that this impacts their rehab and their outcomes and they're all opportunities for us in order to make improvements so we'll talk about that as we go through today how you can maybe think of some different goals to design for those patients that you're seeing um, beyond straight exercise protocols and goals. So osteoarthritis is what we're specifically discussing. And uh, we know the basic diagnosis, it's a progressive deterioration of the cartilage on those weight-bearing surfaces. And I thought this was on the right-hand side really unique. Um, it is a watercolor and ink painting from 1886 of osteoarthritis. And even back then, they were defining the same deterioration of those articular surfaces that we see now that due to that abnormal loading, that the definition hasn't changed much, even though our management opportunities have greatly expanded. When we look at osteoarthritis, it is a progression, and this might help explain why some patients coming in with the same diagnosis, let's say into outpatient or rehab, um, that have not undergone uh, surgical arthroplasty, some progress well, some do not have as positive as an outcome, maybe their pain remains or their restriction, and understanding this progression of osteoarthritis might give you a little more insight if you have the opportunity to look at some of the um, radiologic or or, uh, surgical findings from the physician. What happens with osteoarthritis in stage one? We know that there is a breakdown of the college of the. Um, cartilage for the patient. So over time, normally we have low levels of um, synthesizing and degradation of our cartilage lining based on the activities and the wear and tear that we're participating in. Unfortunately, as we age, or if there's a trauma that occurs at a younger age, the tissues can't adapt as well. So we see that those chondrocytes, they are not um, differentiating completely, that they're unable to produce a good, strong collagen matrix. And we start to see our patient progressing through these different stages of osteoarthritis that lead to progressive joint deterioration. Without that strong collagen matrix, it is thinner, it is unable to um, accept loading as well, it's more disorganized in nature. And we start to see what's called fibrillation of the layers. So if you read reporting and you hear fibrillation, that lets you know the patient somewhere in a stage two osteoarthritis uh, progression. That's a softening of the articulation cartilage. Um, they start to get some vertical clefts in there where they're um, shift in the matrix. And then this deterioration continues to the point where patients in later stages of osteoarthritis, they have a full-blown inflammatory response of the synovium. And this um, 
the remodeling enzymes that are present trying to control that inflammatory process and heal the area are just not successful. So that's when we start to see that significant change in joint architecture that we associate with osteoarthritis. What that looks like on radiologic examination, and I've always enjoyed being able to pull the x-rays on my patients and take a look at them, depending on the setting that you're in, you might get to see a copy of that report. We're looking for these typical uh, findings that we see recognized um, as osteoarthritis. So on radiologic examination, we see a loss of the joint space here. This is a hip with osteoarthritis. We see between the uh, femoral head here and the acetabulum, there is no joint space that's occurring. On the bottom image here, looking at this patient with a knee osteoarthritis, we can see the significant shift in alignment with that valgus uh, deformity of the knee. And then here, we're actually seeing sclerosis of, and um, of the bone and loss of that joint space. If you do have the opportunities to read the x-rays, some of the terminology that you might see, um, the kelgren lawrence grading is the universally accepted method for classifying um, these osteoarthritic changes on x-rays. And it's going to look at the characteristics that we just discussed and assign a grade from one to four in terms of the severity of deterioration. They found that there's good um, intra an intertester reliability with this particular scale. And they actually found that the um, correlation between clinical presentation and you know, pain, restriction, things of that nature correlates well to this uh, grading scale. As we look ahead in our professions to possibility of more direct access, it's important that we're able to understand some of these diagnostic testings a little bit more deeply. Often patients with arthritis of the hip and knee, uh, more so of the knee, may undergo an arthroscopy in order to have an analysis of the joint surfaces. So the outer bridge classification is going to look at the integrity of that articular cartilage itself as opposed to the joint um, alignment on the radiologic examination. And again, this is a grading scale from zero to four where zero is normal and four is leading to that subchondral exposed bone. A grade of one to two is considered mild to moderate arthritis or early arthritis. Um, and in grade three to four is more severe changes of the articular surfaces. And that's if your patient's diagnosed with, you know, more of an advanced type of arthritis. And again, it looks like how deteriorated is that cartilage. And this all correlates with the clinical presentation that we see for the patient of joint pain, morning stiffness, um, and restricted range of motion, that crepitus, that grinding of the joint surfaces. Specifically with knee and hip, we see some uh, hallmark kind of changes. Our hip patients often are going to complain that groin and buttock pain or anterior medial uh, thigh pain for that referral pattern from the joint. Uh, our knee patients, we might start to see some of that uh, genuvalgus type of change um, or medial compartment structures being more stressed. So we see a lot of different clinical presentations for our patients with arthritis. And what we do clinically is conservative management. We're going to use exercise in order to um, strengthen, try to provide more support and external structures. Um, we're going to look at our patient education to decrease forces on the surfaces. We may start managing some of the comorbidities of weight and diabetes, and we have all these different options in order to try and manage our patient. With our goal being to decrease pain, increase mobility, and increase the function for the patients. We'll look at fall avoidance also for the patient. Um, we'll consider activities, and this is reinforced by the research, that are not 
applying additional compressive forces to the joint surfaces. So maybe you're picking aquatics over running for your patient with arthritis. Um, so we know all this. These are all of our traditional management methods. Some additional things that we should be considering are for our patients with knee osteoarthritis, we're going to look at or orthotics for the patient. We're going to uh, potentially consider if orthotic is something that can assist with some of the shock absorption, so less is transmitted up the chain to the knee, or some different types of orthotics that can actually provide stability to the knee joint and control the alignment for more normal movement. In 2015, there was a large study where they um, polled other reports. They did a systematic review of 13 studies, looking at all the different types of orthotics, whether it's a knee, neoprene knee brace or some type of orthotic or wedge in the shoe to then change the forces up the kinematic chain. And what they found is that there really was no one particular type of orthosis that was most beneficial for those patients with the knee osteoarthritis. Um, so again, it might just be something to consider based on your individual patients. Looking at clinical guidelines, I tried to find kind of some standards that are, are out there for osteoarthritis that might be the same across the different um, resources that are available. So I went to um, the guidelines for the um, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the National Institute of Healthcare Excellence, the European Society of Clinical and Economic Aspects of Osteoarthritis, and I love looking international because we're not in a bubble here in the United States and some of you may not even be in the United States. Um, but what I found is while there was no um, one set list of this is what you should do, this is how best to manage the patients, there was definitely some consensus among the organizations as to what not to do, what is not beneficial for our patients with osteoarthritis. And one of the first things on the list are nutraceuticals. So we know everyone is looking at going more natural uh, remedies that are out there and a while back, there was a huge push uh, for glucosamine and chondroitin, and you may still have some patients that are taking that. Uh, the thought was that this particular dietary supplement was going to help uh, grow and repair the cartilage in the joint. There were studies done with over 1,600 participants, and it was not found to have it have a benefit. So this is not recommended as a management strategy. Acupuncture is another example where they attributed any clinical change um, just to maybe the contact from the needles and not, they didn't use the word placebo, but maybe an alternative benefit, nothing really specific uh, to change the impact of that osteoarthritis and improve function for the patients. And then the last one, that you may have heard of is the hyaluron acid. And this is hyaluronic acid is actually um, extracted from the comb of the rooster. It's, it's the rooster picture there. And this started back in Japan in the late 1980s. It kind of wandered its way to Canada, Europe, and made it to the United States in just before the millennium. And what they thought was by injecting this acid into the um, joints, that it would enhance the synovial nourishment. It would have anti-nociceptive, anti-inflammatory processes. Unfortunately, that is just not the case. So this is not recommended uh, by all these various organizations. Where we are seeing a strong recommendation is with prolotherapy. They're finding that um, prolotherapy is showing promise. This is where they're going to inject into the joint of the patient an irritating solution. It's usually some kind of cocktail, and it's different for every physician, of um, a dextrose kind of sugar solution with maybe some lidocaine or an anesthetic, um, maybe vitamins, a little bit of alcohol or cod liver oil, a kind of a combo that is irritating to the joint. They'll make several injections into the joint area over um, several treatments over a couple of weeks. 
And the theory behind this is that they are going to stimulate an inflammatory response by irritating the structures in the area. And in response, the body is going to go through its normal healing process and in part heal the cartilage in the joint and stimulate that collagen regrowth. So it's showing potential promise that it is working for some patients. What's important for us to understand as clinicians is it is the complete opposite of cortisone injections. So if your patient just says they went for an injection, you really need to understand, did they have prolotherapy or did they have a cortisone injection? Cortisone injection is anti-inflammatory. That's calming down the inflammation that may be creating the pain and contributing to um, the decreased mobility. Prolotherapy is creating an irritating inflammatory response to stimulate the healing. So that patient who received prolotherapy, we do not want to have them taking anti-inflammatory medications. We don't prescribe that, but we can reinforce that. If, the, if it's with the physician advised. You're not using cryotherapy to calm down inflammation on those patients. And we're actually going to restrict mobility of that patient maybe for a week, meaning they're not inactive, but we're not being aggressive in our exercise because again, there's a controlled inflammatory response going on in there. So it's really important for about those first seven days that we're cautious in these areas and that you understand what type of injection your patient received. So looking at several different trials, um, they did find that uh, patients, even up to two and a half years out from their prolotherapy injections, that they were receiving uh, positive benefits in terms of Womack functional scores and pain. Um, so it is, again, showing some promise here for our uh, patients. Looking at those different options that we have, what we typically consider conservative management, we know that there are those cases where it's successful. So for those patients with their hip and knee joint and arthritis that have not been able to be managed by conservative techniques, we're looking more at them having to undergo an arthroplasty. So first we're going to take a look at our knee patients. And just a quick little reminder of our knee ligaments in particular, um, because they do come into play with the different surgical techniques. The role of the various ligaments in our knee, particularly this anterior cruciate ligament here, we definitely recognize the relevance of it in the clinical setting. And that anterior cruciate ligament is going to stop that anterior translation of the tibia on the femur compared to our PCL, which is going to stop that posterior translation of the tibia 
on our femur. So those ligaments play an important role and there's something that we need to uh, be aware of during uh, our rehab, whether they're still there or not after that knee replacement. I remember the first time I went into uh, a surgery, my biggest concern was where are those ligaments? Where'd they go? What happens to them? Um, what happens with your general total knee arthroplasty procedure is that that distal end of the femur is shaved off that has been deteriorated. Same thing with that proximal end of the tibia. The physicians use different guides and alignment to assist them in removing just enough of the surface that has deteriorated, but not so much so that there's a leg length discrepancy. And then they are going to use prosthetic implants. There are a variety of different considerations that the physician has. We're going to take a look at the design of the implant, the prosthetics themselves, how they're fixed in the joint, and then the different surgical techniques that the physician can utilize. In the 1950s is about when total knee arthroplasty um, began being utilized more commonly. And what they found is that there was sometimes loosening and stability issues. So in the 1970s, they went ahead and kind of realized that the ligaments played an important role and we might need to salvage some of those. And then finally, by the 80s, they realized particularly that posterior cruciate ligament is really important. I said that that posterior cruciate ligament controls that posterior glide of the tibia on the femur. And that really makes a uh, uh, difference for that deep knee bending for our patients for stair negotiation and functional tasks. So they realize the value of that PCL. Let's take a look at some of the different prosthetic components. The implant for the prosthesis is typically going to be some type of uh, metal. It may be uh, cobalt, chrome, titanium, different types. Um, it weighs only about 15 to 20 ounces, maybe a pound. So ladies, uh, your female patients that say that knee joint made them gain weight, it did, maybe a pound, right? <laughs> um, so uh, also we're looking at the fact that they continue to consider different materials to make the prosthetics more durable. Um, ceramics is something that has been looked at in Europe and there, oh, that's not approved in the United States right now for use, but for the total knee, the ceramic implants in Europe are approved for patients who may have a nickel allergy. If there's any nickel in the Im other implants where it can't be um, utilized. They're thinking maybe looking ahead that there might be less wear and tear on those ceramic components, but uh, it's not approved yet in the United States. Where they have made progress is that they found that the male and the female anatomy is different. The female anatomy tends to be a little more narrow. So now they're uh, designing components that are a little more gender specific that allow for better alignment. The different types of implants that can be utilized depending on the arthritis that the patient presents with. The unicompartmental design is going to be appropriate um, for patients where there is just um, one side of the femoral condyle and the tibial articular surface that has been deteriorated, so maybe a patient with a little more of a traumatic arthritis, um, or your older patient where they're just not going to have as much wear and tear and they don't want to have them undergo the time and the rigors of a full total knee arthroplasty, they're just going to replace kind of that one pole that has been uh, deteriorated. These knees have good stability because all of the ligaments are remaining uh, intact. And then for that younger patient, it does still allow the option of a total knee replacement down the road for that patient. Another type of implant design is the bilateral or cruciate retaining design. So in this one, they are keeping both the ACL as well as the PCL intact for the patient. So with arthritis, what tends to happen is we said in the later stages that inflammation of the synovium can cause deterioration of the ligaments also. In patients who are younger, or maybe it's a traumatic type of arthritis or some other pathology leading to the knee replacement, placement, they're finding that if the ligaments are intact, they're able to retain a little what they call bone box. So they'll keep a little chunk of the femur in place where the ligaments attach and same thing down on the tibia. And then the implant design kind of goes around it 
What they found in patients, if they can retain both the ACL as well as the PCL, um, that they tend to have better proprioception and there's improved patient satisfaction uh, that's occurring. It's a more technically demanding procedure for the physician. Um, they have to use fluoroscopy to locate those ligaments, uh, but this might be something we'll see emerging a little bit more in the future. For most of our patients, what they are going to undergo is the posterior cruciate uh, stabilizing procedure. Looking at this knee, as I said, here where the ligaments should be located, they have completely deteriorated because of the arthritic changes. So what the prosthesis has to do is recreate the stabilization that the posterior cruciate ligament would have allowed. So there are a couple of different names for this, but ultimately it's a full condylar prosthesis that is going to replicate what the ligament would have done. So in order to accomplish that, the prosthetic design itself, when we look at it, the um, femoral ponent here has a cutout. And then the tibial component, I'll use a different color here, you see it has this little lip coming up. And what they call that kind of little hook in the uh, polyethylene component of the tibial portion is going to lock in to the cam, which is the opening in the femoral component. So as the patient bends, it kind of locks in to stop that gliding. So we can see it's sticking up a little bit right here through the prosthetic component. So this is what's going to stop that anterior, uh, sorry, that uh, translation posteriorly of the tibia on the femur with that deep knee bending. What they find is that there's easier balancing of contractures for patients when they take out both, both uh, the ligaments and allows greater range of motion. Unfortunately, what they find sometimes in patients that do have both ligaments uh, removed is that there are some other types of shifting that occur in the joint that can lead to loosening. Another syndrome that they see developing in some patients that have, it could be either type of total knee um, arthroplasty. It tends to be a little more pre prevalent in the individuals who have the posterior stabilizing is what's called patellar clunk. And can I tell you, I wish I had a time machine to go back to the early 90s because I have a patient, I can picture myself being on the rehab mat with her and I'm listening to her knee as she extends it and there's, you could hear the clunk. You actually hear like a clunk of the patella shifting. I could see the patella shift. I could hear her say there's a little bit of pain with it. And it was just never really figured out what was going on. Decades later, here we are, patellar clunk syndrome. So this is what it is. If you have patients about three to nine months out, total knee arthroplasty, it could be up to a year. And they do not have crepitus in the joint because 
the joint surfaces no longer exist, it's prosthetic. Um, but they do have, as they go into extension, there's an audible clunk and they feel um, some discomfort and you can palpate it. What they're finding here on arthroscopic analysis on the right, this is the posterior surface of the patella tendon. And can you see all of these adhesions and scar tissue that have formed? So what happens is that's forming here on that upper pole of the um, patella, uh, patella tendon, and those fibrous nodules, as the patient goes into knee flexion, the patella is going to settle into the patellofemoral groove. And then when the patient's extending, when they hit about this 30 to 45 degrees, right up in here, all of that scar tissue is actually going to cause a clunk, and it's going to cause a shifting of the patella in that groove and it's going to uh, create for that patient some um, pain and discomfort. Um, you may find with these particular patients that as you are trying to rehab them, you can't get under to that patellar surface to, you know, uh, friction out those different adhesions. Uh, conservative management is kind of ruled out everything else as creating the knee pain and the shifting and ultimately what they're finding is that um, in the implant design that sometimes that groove in the femoral channel is not deep enough for the patella so over time it develops those small adhesions and fibrosis on the posterior surface of the tendon and often the physician needs to go back in and um, to breed out in that area to, to resolve the problem. They t some of the research says um, that it happens more commonly in patients where the posterior surface of the patella has not been resurfaced. Um, during the procedure of the arthroplasty. So again, knowing surgical procedure may help you figure this out, but it may mean referral back to the uh, physician if you see that patellar clunk developing. And we are picking up with discussing, um, we're going to talk about femoral rollback. So we are looking at that um, prosthetic alignment and talking about femoral roll mac and that roll of the PCL that has been removed during uh, this particular surgical technique, the posterior cruciate stabilizing. Um, this is a patient on the right-hand side of the screen, let me change my color here, who um, is in this deep knee flexion position and they're taking an x-ray of her knee. So that's what we see here on the left-hand side. And what they've done is they've superimposed the prosthetic components onto this actual patient's uh, scan um, because we're, we're able to see the soft tissue here also. So it's actually not an x-ray. <laughs> um, so what happens is we said that, that there has to be a balance between the ability of the opening or the cam in the femoral component to allow gliding on the um, notch coming up from the tibial polyethylene liner, there has to be a balance of allowing that motion to occur, but also not allowing that slippage. The reason this is really important is because we have all of this soft tissue here posteriorly in the joint that we don't want to cause compression on the tendons. Most tonal knee replacements, they're saying typical uh, design of them are allowing about 120 degrees maximal knee flexion. And that's important to know because, um, you know, we're, we're not looking at getting much more than that out of our patients. Unless they have a newer design model, some of those models allow up to 150 degrees of deep knee flexion. Again, that would depend on the uh, soft tissue allowance up by the patient, but it's something to ask your physician kind of what range you expect to the model that you have, because right, what do our knee patients do? They compete. They see who has how much motion. And for some, it might not be your rehab. It might not be the patient. It just might be the design of the prosthesis. So what happens is, as this patient goes into deep knee flexion, as we said, this tibia is naturally going to shift slightly posterior on the femur, and that should check or stop. And that's where it's stopping about at that 100 to 150 degrees, depending on the design. The reason this is so important is because posteriorly here, we have those tendons of our hamstring 
coming in. And if it glides back too far, we're going to encroach on those tendons and potentially um, cause irritation of them. So that um, needs to be cautiously looked at by the physician and the companies that are manufacturing the prostheses. They're kind of making that balance there of not causing soft tissue damage, but allowing as much range of motion as possible while maintaining the integrity and stability of the prosthetic design. An alternative design in patients where they are able to salvage that posterior cruciate ligament where their natal ligament has not deteriorated is using the posterior cruciate retaining design. This design we've seen um, develop in like the late 1970s. Um, and it has evolved to allow for retention of that ligament. If we look at the design structure of the prosthesis, it obviously has to be different in order to retain a bony box where that ligament is naturally attaching. So when we look at the design of the component itself, this on the right hand side of the screen, we're looking at the tibial component. So the metal component that um, is affixed to the tibia, see it has a cutout here to allow the patient's natural bone box here this to stay in place on the tibia, and then the prosthetic component goes around it, and the um, polyethylene liner kind of has a matching cutout in it. So we have that natural ligament staying in place, and then the femoral component has the same thing. It'll have a cutout back in here to allow that natural PCL to stay in place. The benefit, in addition to the stability that we just talked about, is that it's really going to retain more of those normal or natural kinematics of the knee for movement to give better stability because the natural joint is going to be more effective than the prosthetic component. And what they actually found from interviewing um, patients who have had this type of prosthesis implanted is that um, they tend to report a little more proprioceptive awareness, that it feels uh, more natural to them than uh, patients that have the other. It's also, again, going to give us a little better stability with that deep knee bending, particularly things like stairs and uh, squatting for the patient. When we compare the outcomes of these two different designs, um, I really wanted there to be a difference. Like I didn't know which way, which way I was placing my bet, um, but in looking at the information, uh, the research has shown several different studies, um, particularly one by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons in 2017. I actually read their surgical guide. I found it interesting, um, but intense reading. And what they found is that there's really no strong evidence either way for the posterior cruciate retention versus stabilizing where they take it out. Um, the outcomes in terms of all the different indicators, the WOMAC, the Knee Society score, the, the HIPS uh, score, um, that complication rates, they really didn't find any significant difference um, when they said it ultimately is going to come down to the physician choice once he sees the integrity of the structures in the knee and which procedure he feels he's able to better align and restore the integrity of the joint. Because they have to remember they're shaving off the bone and placing in implants that have a thickness to them. And they're trying to retain the um, you know length tension relationships of the other collateral ligaments, of the different muscular structures. So they say it really comes down to physician um, preference in that case. I found a systematic review from 2014 that also looked at this question. They looked at 20 different studies, um, around over 2,000, almost 2,400 uh, different knees. They didn't find a significant difference. They said um, maybe there was a little bit of a two degree range of motion increase in patients who had the posterior cruciate uh, stabilizing, two point higher functional score, but that's on a 100 point scale, so it wasn't statistically different. So outcome-wise, we're looking similar there.
Looking at the tibial component a little more uh, specifically, because they're trying to look at longevity and function for patients, when they are applying this uh, tibial component in the bottom right here, what you're seeing in the top portion, I should use a different color, here we go, top portion here is that uh, femoral component, here is our patella getting its button over here, and then here is our tibial component. It's amazing they can find anything in there, right? Um, so what they're finding with that tibial component is that it can either be a fixed bearing where once it implants on the tibia, um, so you have the metal component and the plastic polyethylene on top of that, that polyethylene can be fixed and not moving, or it can have a little bit of a mobile design that has a little bit of a uh, glide to a little bit of a rotation. The fixed bearing design, what they're finding is similar to the natural cartilage that um, if there's not you know, perfect alignment, let's say the patient has a little valgus or varus or their functional activities are putting pressure more in one area, as it glides, kind of like the brake pads on your car, what's going to happen? It's going to wear out at that single point of contact. And down here, what you've seen is an implant that's been removed from a patient, and we could see the wear here, where it's actually gone down to the metal. Um, so that's a concern with the with this particular design because as that wears out it's going to release ions into the surrounding area and little particulate and this can change pain and function in your patient so do think about further out in rehab patients that have that pain pattern presenting where you've kind of ruled out everything else it might be aware of the uh, component now the mobile bearing design it's attempting to replicate that screw home mechanism of uh, the knee as we perform the flexion and extension. We do get that slight bit of rotation. So the mobile design is going to allow for that rotation uh, to occur. The idea with this is that particularly in younger patients or those who are obese, that that little bit of rotation within the components themselves is going to allow for a better functioning um, knee. The problem is if the mobile components themselves are moving, something has to help um, stabilize them. So we really need good strengthening. If your patient has the mobile design, you really have to look at your muscle balances extra in particular to make sure that you develop more external stability because the challenge with this design is they actually have to remove the PCL to have enough surface area to allow for that rotation. So they're sacrificing the PCL that I just probably convinced you needed to stay <laughs> for in some cases um, for this mobile design, but they feel that that mobile design is going to be giving uh, improved kinematics and allow for um, less wear. So again, physician preference. Here's why that wear is so important. And if you look at the middle portion of the slide here, this, that I'm circling. That is black that you're seeing. That's not the dimmer on your uh, computer screen. Um, this is an 81-year-old patient who had undergone a total knee replacement. About seven years out, the patient was complaining of, you know, pain, decreased function. Um, there was concern of what was happening. He developed what uh, looked like here in this image, kind of like small cysts that we may think maybe, you know, if it was a Baker cyst, if there was some tissue left intact or um, some other cystic changes, they went in and um, aspirated those for the patient. Aspiration didn't uh, reveal anything. Um, we're thinking maybe, right, it could be a sarcoma because looking at his knee on the far left here, this is a nice healed incision, a little bit of deminous and swollen, but other than that, a, what we would think a relatively intact knee that we would be trying to conservatively manage. Uh, what ended up happening is they did a biopsy of this patient and the patient had metallosis. So the pro 
the bearing had actually, the polyethylene had worn out on this patient during those seven years. And here it is on the right, you can see the uh, wear. And it wore down to the point where then the metal was grinding on the metal with the little particulate being released into the patient's surrounding area. And that's all the black that you see. Um, you're seeing the body try to engulf that. So this particular patient um, underwent osteolysis and there were other changings in the surrounding bone structure and other tissues. We never know what's happening underneath there. So this is where that referral and communication with the physician is important. This patient had a great outcome because the team did communicate. Um, in the bottom image here, look at how nicely they were able to clean out that knee, place in a new component, and two and a half years later, patient still had no problems. So I bring this to bear because uh, sometimes there are things that are out of our scope of practice and when you kind of get that gut that something's uh, not right or you've ruled out all other causes, particularly in your total joints, something like this may be going on. We're not going to alarm the patient, but we're going to communicate with our physician as a team. Looking at the overall outcomes for that mobile versus the fixed bearing, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, again, in their guide, they didn't hedge their bets one way or the other. They said that there's no strong evidence one way versus the other um, on various assessment tools, looking at health-related quality of life, function, even looking at revision rate. Um, they said about three more knees per thousand with the mobile bearing needed revision, but they didn't deem that as statistically uh, significant. And this data comes from a recent study. It was a 2015 uh, Cochrane review. So again, it becomes down to that surgical preference of the physician, what he feels he could achieve the best alignment and stability with for the patient. The actual fixation of the prosthetic components themselves, um, there are similar uh, outcomes for the patient, whether cement is used or not used in that tibial component. Usually the femoral component has a trabecular surface, so the bone regrows back in. And then on the tibial component, it can go um, either way. If they are using cement, they're going to use um, an antibiotic loaded cement to decrease the risk of an infection. So loosening that we may see over time in patients with um, total knee replacements, particularly loosening of that tibial um, component, is going to be what we call aseptic without an infection um, type of loosening. And what tends to happen over time is that um, you may have like a macrophage induced inflammatory response that occurs as that little particulate debris is developing in the joint if we do have some wearing of the components. Let's say 10 to 20 years out, we have a little bit of wear and tear, tear of the polyethylene, maybe a little bit of this metal on metal rubbing starts to occur, that matter is released into the surrounding tissues that we looked at, and the macrophages are going to respond, creating that osteolysis, that breakdown of some of the surrounding bone where the prosthetic components implanted. So it creates then a little bit of micromotion every time the patient weight bears and unweights and takes a step, kind of perpetuating this process. And that can lead to loosening um, for some patients. How those patients may present, uh, the research is saying that they may have increased pain with weight bearing. Uh, a lot of times the erythrocyte sedimentation rate uh, on the labs is normal because it's not systemic, it's more localized. Um, so again, those patients who have that odd pain pattern uh, later on might necessitate that referral back to the physician to figure out what's happening. Another question that arises is what happens to that patella? <laughs> Um, the question with the patella, it's always, you know, do they put a button on? Do they leave it? Do they take it out? Um, there are many different options that the physician has based on the integrity of that patella. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, guess what? Yes, again, they said there's no statistical difference that they can find in terms of which is more beneficial. Um, there's some moderate evidence that says if they resurface the patella where they shave, shave off the cartilage and put like a little um, button on the back of it, is that it could 
contribute to better stability of the prosthesis, that there may be a less incident of that aseptic loosening because you don't have that natural patella trying to glide on a prosthetic. You have prosthetic on prosthetic um, from that little, little button. Um, they do say that in some patients that they may have about five years out if they have like an odd anterior uh, knee pain. Um, that those that have the button implanted and the resurfacing have less of that anterior knee pain five years out. So again, just something to be aware of in terms of those components. When the physician actually goes in to perform the surgical technique, he has many different options of how he's going to get this exposure that we just discussed. And the procedures, um, like I said, if you line up all your knee patients, in addition to comparing range of motion, what do they do? They compare scars. And you, we see an array, not only in length, but also in uh, direction and pattern. So there are about five different approaches that the physician can take in terms of their um, knee incision to access the tissues. I'm just going to touch on uh, a couple of them. Uh, I put a write up here of all so that if you, you have those patients who ask, you can maybe give them a little bit of insight. The one that we're going to discuss more in depth is the most common technique of the uh, medial patellar resection. And in this surgical approach, the physician is going to um, come down and they are going to cut down through the quad tendon. They're going to come medially around the patella and then back down through the rest of that uh, patellar tendon. So it kind of goes a little bit around that uh, medial surface here. What they found um, is by doing that procedure, if you look down here on the bottom right, what they're able to do then is when they flex that knee a little bit, they can take this patella now and they can flip it back to get good exposure of the joint surfaces for the patient. They found that cutting through the tendon, the tendon actually heals faster than the muscle fibers itself. So that is going to lead to a more functional quad muscle more rapidly after surgery uh, for the patient that that tendon is actually going to heal a little bit um, faster at, and, and again gives them that good exposure to complete the surgical procedure. What we need to be aware of as clinicians is that when that patient has that medial in Decision, this VMO muscle is going to be impacted. So we really need to do extra strengthening of that vastus medialis so that we don't have a lateral tracking uh, issue of the patella. Another option of surgical procedure, just to kind of compare the two, in terms of approaches, instead of the medial approach, looking at the top right here, some physicians may opt to do the lateral approach where they do the same thing through the quad tendon, except they're going to come down laterally here around the outside. It's more uncommon of a procedure. They might utilize this a little bit more if the patient has a significant um, valgus deformity of the knee, because if the patient has that valgus deformity of the knee, if they do a lateral incision and flip this way, see they can get better exposure of the lateral portion that they may have to resect out in order to restore alignment. Kind of the challenge here is that um, for the patient who has the lateral, you know, val who has a valgus deformity, see how they tend to naturally laterally track? Well, if they do a medial incision, some physicians feel like that extra weakness during healing time of the VMO and disruption of the VMO tissues may further lead to greater lateral tracking post-surgically, so they want to avoid that, and they'll do the incision the opposite way to try and maintain some of the integrity of the tissues. Again, physician preference. What we hear a lot is minimally invasive, right? That's been the... 
terminology for a while. What does that actually mean? Um, there's really not a specific definition. Generally speaking, when we're looking at knees, minimally invasive means that the incision length is shorter. That we're looking at about a four to six inch incision as opposed to an eight uh, to 10 inch incision for a traditional total knee replacement. Um, this is a more technically demanding procedure for the physician because he has less room to work. And again, if he's making a shorter incision, as they try to fl flip that patella, there has to be extra caution taken so that the um, attachment is not avulsed off of the tibial tuberosity. Um, so there has to be a little more um, awareness there on the physician's part to be cautious. Sometimes they'll, that's the reason they'll do a little more robotic assisted in that minimally invasive procedure. The infrapatellar fat pad is a soft tissue that you may not have ever thought of, um, but this is something that in the research is gain a little bit more discussion. The infrapatellar fat pad, if we look at the image on the right, this is sitting just um, below the patella kind of between the bony structures and the uh, patellar ligament. Um, and sometimes this is referred to as Hoffa's pad. Um, what's interesting is that uh, in 2015, they did a systematic review of about 10,000 patients who had um, total knee replacements. Historically, they always took out this fat pad um, just because it would be, it's intimate with the joint and with all of the inflammation of the various structures, you know, it was just removed along with everything else that had deteriorated. Well, what the research is now saying is there's more discussion that maybe that fat pad should be left. And I'd be curious if you communicate with your physicians to, to ask them if they leave it in or take it out, um, because this is what that fat pad does. When the knee is inflamed during the period of arthritis, this fat pad is going to uh, kind of serve as a mediator for the nociceptive response, for the pain response. So um, that fat pad, if it helps mediate the pain response, so there's inflammation, the fat pad is sending signals um, to the nociceptor saying, yes, there's inflammation, there's pain, you should be firing. When they take this out during surgery, now that that patient does no longer, they no longer have the painful structures in the joint. So their pain level should decrease. Now they're going to have that healing pain that we know of, but that arthritic pain should be deteriorating. Without that fat pad there to recognize that the, it's not receiving those inflammatory mediators that trigger it, to give the pain response, it can't downregulate. The nociceptors are not receiving the input from the fat pad to downregulate and stop the painful sensations. So they're finding theoretically in some patients that they're actually having more anterior pain because they don't have this fat pad there to help downregulate. So again, something else to consider with your patients, why some may have anterior knee pain you know, later on and some don't, it could be um, related to the role of this fat pad that they're, that they're investigating. Regardless of all these different techniques and interventions that are utilized, when we look at the longevity of the total knee replacement, one study looking at patients up to 15 uh, years out, they said that 90% of the patients still had a functioning um, arthroplasty of the knee. Um, generally, they're saying, you know, 20 to 30 years is about the wear time of our total knee uh, replacement patients at this point in time. Not of the patient, I should say of the knee arthroplasty comp prosthetic components themselves for our patients. Um, Moving a little proximal up our chain, we'll go through the same pieces of information related to our total hip arthroplasty. When we look at this surgical procedure, there um, are several different components, fixation, and again, surgical approaches that can be utilized. Generally speaking, they're removing the femoral head and they're placing a cup for the acetabular component to restore the articulation of those uh, joint surfaces and correct any deformities that may have occurred. 
Hip resurfacing is a procedure that um, was utilized for several years. The theory is great that you're going to take your patients uh, or the physician is going to take the patient's femoral head that has the articular wear. They're going to shave that down and they will apply uh, on the bottom right here, they'll apply a femor metal femoral cap with a short little stem. And then that is going to articulate with like a press fit component that goes directly into the acetabulum. So no reaming or change of the acetabulum. It's able to just press fit in and then the metal femoral component goes in there. Uh, the thought was that this is going to um, retain a little more of the integrity of the joint. If we look at the top image here, this really short stem, it doesn't require them to alter the femoral neck alignment. So the theory was it retained better articulation. Problem is, as I said, it's metal on metal. What happens to our car brakes when we have metal on metal, right? We have wearing and fragmentation. The FDA has actually put out a warning related to these hip resurfacing procedures saying very definitively metal ions from a metal on metal implant will enter the bloodstream. So when your patient says that they have had hip resurfacing or a part of my hip replaced, or if you're not positive, it is a total hip replacement, um, and they didn't have a fracture where you can confirm it's a ORIF, if you think they have a hip resurfacing, we really need to be cautious with these patients, whether you're seeing them for their hip or, or something else, and it comes up in conversation, um, because we're seeing long-term dire effects for these particular patients patients. Um, what happens is the uh, repeated articulation creates little metal ions that are going to be released into the patient's um, surrounding tissues. This next slide lets us take a closer look at why these hip resurfacing procedures are failing. What happens is the metal ions release into the uh, surrounding tissues, so they're having the metallosis. If we look what's happening under that metallic femoral cap that has been in place, the um, femoral head is still intact. They just saved, shaved down the cartilage. So if you look at the trabecular surface of the bone here, can you see all of the weakening that has occurred, all of the thinning of the bone? surface that's occurring. We know that Wolf's Law, the bone integrity is going to react to the stresses placed upon it. Well, the stress is not being borne by the bone, so it is deteriorating. They're actually starting to see fracturing here of the bone margins. And this is the actual uh, bottom left implant that's removed from a patient. And they develop here what's called a pseudotumor. And we see this on the right here sticking out. And you can really appreciate the wear that has occurred. And what's happening is that the pseudotumor is developing from those little metal fragments that have been released. Um, there's lymphatic aggregation in the area as they try to engulf the pieces of metal and protect the body. And this is a histologic examination here. And you can actually see all that black are the little metal fragments with the body trying to protect itself. It's unable to really do that effectively over the long term. And some of those um, metal ions are actually going to start leaching into the circulatory system. And for your patients, how they're going to present in addition to the hip restrictions in motion and pain, we're going to start to see systemic changes in these patients. And what's going to occur is that that high release of the uh, metal debris leads to toxicity, particularly of the kidneys. We're going to see um, not only renal impairment, but neurologic changes. So think about this in your older population. We're going to see cognitive um, impairment occurring. We may start to see some auditory and visual uh, changes 
rashes. Some patients developed skin rashes. Some patients developed a hypothyroidism, um, you know, with increased fatigue. So if you're having patients who have pain and swelling of the hip, decreased function and kind of an odd combination of other system uh, dysfunction, it may be that metal toxicity for them to, again, refer them back to the physician. The preference is total hip arthroplasty. And looking at the total hip arthroplasty uh, procedure, they are going to remove the femoral head and they are going to uh, insert a uh, femoral shaft and then there'll be a glenoid cup with a plastic or polyethylene, I should say, liner implanted that are going to articulate to avoid that metal on metal um, articulation. The components are very modular because they have to account for the femoral neckline of each patient and the acetabular angulation. So it's kind of like a little puzzle that the physician is attempting to uh, recreate there. They're looking at using some ceramic uh, implants for patients. Um, the problem is with the ceramic on metal, um, they're not having positive uh, results because again, there may be some leaching of the metal. Ceramic on ceramic implants, they're finding have an audible squeak. So they're working through the, the options there. Considering these different recalls, I took a little bit of time and I went to the FDA website and our patients hear these things on TV, right? Particularly if you're listening, it's usually dinner time. It seems a lot of those commercials come on that have you ever experienced? And then there's a Esquire number that uh, follows. Um, well, you know, my first reaction is I go right to the FDA website to get firsthand information for myself because the likelihood is one of my patients is going to say, hey, I heard this. So I just pulled some um, FDA recalls related to arthroplasty that have occurred recently. Just so you understand a little bit about the FDA recall um, classification, a uh, class three recall, that's not really likely to cause any um, health concerns for the patient. There'll be some reversible consequences. A level or class two recall may cause some temporary medical compromise. And a class uh, one recall is going to have a reasonable probability that it will cause um, adverse effects or death for the patient. So those class one recalls that I pulled, um, one of them in 2016 was for one of the tools that they utilized to implant the acetabular cup. They, it was intended to um, be able to be multiple use with uh, re-sterilization after each patient. Unfortunately, they found that the sterilization uh, was failing in between. It couldn't really clean it. The second one that I found was looking at a femoral component. So looking at the angulation, it was kind of like a modular femoral neck that would allow for multiple um, alignment in the patient. They found that it just wasn't stable enough and it's actually fracturing in some patients. And you may have patients out there that have, have that component. Um, and then finally, what they found on a particular type of, again, hip, um, femoral component is that there was actually a residue left on it during manufacturing. So when it was implanted into the patient, unbeknownst to the physician, patients were having allergic reactions to the residue. It was leading to infection and pain. Uh, so some different things out there, again, things that go beyond what we would expect, but might be considered um, referral back to the physician when you have those odd pain patterns or things we just can't manage because there might be other other um, components that are contributing. The only knee recall that I found was that it was a mislabeling of a package and the physician clearly realized that when he opened it up so it didn't lead to any consequence. Looking at the femoral um, and acetabular components when they are successfully implanted into the patient, that acetabular um, component, they're going to remount inside the acetabulum and it's going to be a porous component that is press fit in so the trabecular surface of the bone can grow in and then they might implant a screw here in order to help stabilize it or cement it. 
the femoral component, they have some different options on how to fixate the femoral component. Uh, this was a really neat picture I was excited to locate on the left-hand side. We have an actual patient's bone with the, the uh, femoral stem implanted here, and we can really appreciate how well that trabecular surface allows for the bone growth, natural bone growth back in, or they may use cementing that they're going to remount the femoral shaft and then they're going to implant uh, cement for the patient and then fit in the femoral component. Looking at our outcomes on the cemented versus the cement less for patients, um, what they're finding is that they do not need to utilize the cement. They prefer that trabecular surface that the natural bone goes into. For our younger patients who have a really healthy, good bone stock, um, that the patient who has osteoporosis, they're more likely to opt for that cement in order to give stabilization. The idea here is that they want to limit the opportunity for a loosening failure among patients. So they're finding that, that in our younger patients, the cementless is having still good uh, stability for those patients decades out. Looking at the procedural approach for the total hip replacement, um, looking at the incision, traditionally the posterior approach is what was utilized. They're going to come in along this yellow line here for our patients, um, split between the um, glute max for the patient. The incision is going to come posterior lateral for them. And what they're finding for patients as they go through this particular procedure with that posterior approach, they say that this is better visualization of the entire hip. We can see here is our femoral head being resected out for the patient. We can imagine now we our patients are in so much pain because this is very traumatizing. What they do is they take the piriformis and the gemelli. So when we're looking at our total hip patient kind of from that um, posterior lateral view, the piriformis and gemelli that are sitting here, they sit, some physicians say they roll those back and they kind of wrap it around the sciatic nerve to help protect it during the surgical procedure. What they're finding is that this posterior approach is uh, beneficial for patients for exposure. Uh, the problem is that it does disrupt the hip abductor muscles, the glute medius and minimus. So the patients tend to have a little more weakness postoperatively in that muscle group. So patients with that posterior lateral approach, they're definitely going to need help with that abduction. They may need ADL tools in order to help. Uh, all of the patients need help with ADL tools for dressing, but particularly with abduction, posterior lateral is going to need additional assistance. Anterior approach has been on the rise. We're seeing more patients with the anterior incision. The reason that this has um, become 
more utilized, starting around 2009, um, is that it is not only a smaller incision for the patient, the real key here is that it's less disruptive to the musculature. Right here in the picture on the left, what we're looking at is, um, here is our iliac crest. We have our groin area down here. So what we can see is the sartorius muscle of our patient here is going from the ASIS diagonal down. And then we are also going to have our tensor fasciolata muscle here on the iliac crest. And in that fem anterior femoral triangle, they kind of create just like a natural space that can just be opened up by the physician without disrupting any of the musculature. So this small anterior incision that the patient receives on the right-hand side here, is allowing the physician to go in, kind of spread out the anatomy a little bit, and then do the replacement anteriorly so they're not disrupting as many muscles on the patient. The challenge is that they have to have a different type of table in order to perform this. If you see the patient here is lying um, on their left side with the right leg up, that'll be the surgical um, leg. And the reason that they have to have the special table for the patient when they're um, undergoing the procedure is they actually have to dislocate the hip. So they need to extend, adduct, and uh, rotate the hip to pop it out for this procedure. So they need the different uh, table, takes a little bit more expertise for the physician. But again, the key here is that they're finding patients um, are able to be a little more functional earlier on after rehab because the surgical procedure is less disruptive. On the downside, like I said, it requires specific um, equipment in order to be performed, so a little more of a learning curve for the physician also. When they compare the outcomes for patients, anterior versus posterior approach, there really is no significance in the uh, clinical outcomes, which means the physician is making the right choice, the right patients. And what they're finding is that uh, longitudinal studies looking about 12 months out of patients that have had um, both types of total hip replacements, there is a little bit better at 12 months, you know, three, six, nine, kind of 12 months out of patients with that anterior approach approach, they're finding that they have a better improvement of their function early on because of that less disruption to the soft tissue. trends is looking at being uh, minimally invasive for the surgical procedure, less trauma. Again, there's no one set definition. It could just mean that there is a smaller incision that's occurring, but it could also mean that the physician is utilizing robotic assisted techniques. 
And when they use robotic assisted techniques, the surgeon is still actually performing the surgery. And this is something that I've actually had to clarify with some patients because they think the physician not even there, that literally a robot is doing their surgery. So the idea with robotic assisted is that the physician can use a lot of computer pre-planning and when they go in with the robotic tools, it means that they're still controlling them. They just don't directly have their hands in that surgical space. And you know how your car can um, vibrate or beep or give you some feedback? It's almost like that. Some of the tools could be set so that the physician pre-plans how much bone he has to shave off. And the tool, the robotic tool, will give him a little guide to say, okay, you reached that point. So it may allow more specificity in surgery um, for the physician so there could be better alignment and better outcomes. When they look at uh, that possibility in the research, they're actually finding that there can be improved alignment and stability. Their debate is still out there as to whether or not um, the dislocation rate is changed. Um, but generally speaking, the research is saying they're seeing similar results with the robotic assisted as well as the traditional technique, that it really comes down to physician skill. When we think about dislocation, we all know the classic total hip precautions for our patients that we are looking at, avoiding um, putting each in position because there has been loss now of the joint capsule that normally provided stability to this joint, it has been removed. And while the prosthetic components can provide some alignment, it's not the same as the natural joint. Um, generally, what they're finding is that um, matching patients up for gender, surgical technique, comorbidities, they're really finding that um, there's not any change in the rate of dislocation between the anterior versus posterior approach. What it comes down to is just actually having the patient follow those precautions. So looking at those anterior hip precautions, the concern is going to be that if the patient goes into an extended as well as an adducted and externally rotated position, that's when the hip can dislocate. And OTs, I think, are probably um, thinking more of precautions with this than us, those of us in PT and athletic training, because with a lot of ADLs, if you're standing in a closed chain position, you want to watch. You don't want the patient to turn away. So if they're at their kitchen table or their counter and they turn their upper body and they reach back, that creates that dislocation position. So you want to be cautious there. Looking at our total hip posterior precautions, when a patient has a posterior total hip precaution and the incision is here and disruption of those tissues, we're going to watch when the patient goes into flexion, adduction, and internal rotation would dislocate. So we're going to be cautious more here with our patients um, in terms of their bed mobility, in terms of their sitting, not getting into that deep hip flexion. Because when they do sit in that deep hip flexion, that's when, particularly think of with toileting, where they flex forward and turn, that can lead to a dislocation risk. So you want to educate your patient on their total hip precautions post-operatively. Generally speaking, looking at post-operative uh, precautions, Medicare is really looking at a different uh, payment scale, and they are holding facilities much more accountable. They came out with a comprehensive care for joint replacement model, where they're looking at hospital readmissions, and they are holding this facility responsible where the technique where the surgery was performed for the first 90 days of care for that patient. So any complications that a patient may incur during those first 90 days of care is going to be attributed back to that facility that completed the surgery. So the idea here is they're going with the quality first model. They're saying if you minimize complications, you're giving a better care to your patients, and guess what? You'll get reimbursed. So they're really looking at tracking the different types of complications and facilities now actually have to report in the first seven days, 30 days, and 90 days, the different types of complications that patients are experiencing. And this information is actually published out there. So patients can, they're consumers, they can you know, shop different facilities, different positions, and see who has the better outcomes.
for us to be aware is that we play a role in diminishing some of these complications for our patient, regardless of what setting you're seeing them in and what rehab role you're playing. The first one we're going to take a look at is infection risk. So uh, both of these are great healing incisions for our patients. Generally speaking, about 13 days out, these staples are going to be removed from the patient, a steri strip supplied, and the wound is healing well. This is what we want to say. This is not what happens with all patients, that our uh, most common complications that are occurring for our total knees and our third most common complications for our hips are that infection that's setting in. So remember your patients, again, regardless of what you're treating them for, if you know they have a history of any joint replacement and they mention to you, you know, I finally am going to spend that money and get my teeth replaced, make sure they're going for that prophylactic antibiotic medication before dental work because that dental area, when work is done, it creates a portal of entry into the circulatory system for bacteria, of which there's a plethora in our mouth. And often that travels through the bloodstream to go to the sensitive areas, the foreign areas, and those joint replacements. So those patients have to meet with their physician first and be on prophylactic antibiotics before they go for dental work. So picking up with post-operative uh, complications, particularly infection, looking at a patient's uh, knee joint, example here, um, a, sorry, hip joint, a patient who has a total joint replacement, we know to monitor for Ruber, Caller, Dolar, those signs of infection, decreased range of motion, pain, things of that nature. And it's something that I just wanted us to take a look again and kind of remind ourselves what's happening underneath the tissues because it is very serious. This is a patient who has an infected incision on the left, but look at the right, what's actually going on there. You can see the purulent, um, drainage, all the soft tissue damage from the infection. Here's a patient with a total knee arthroplasty that has been infected. This has already been debrided of the um, infectious area. It's important for us to try and be on the side of preventing these infections and contributing to the prevention as much as possible because it's a kind of a two-stage process for the patients. They have to go in and debride and clean out the infection. The, on the right here, you'll see they'll kind of put in a block, a spacer that is antibiotic loaded to allow healing of the infection of the bone and the soft tissues. And then they go back in for another surgical procedure for the actual replacement. To be on the um, front end of this and work collaboratively with the physician to help limit it, during part of your preoperative education for the patient, consider that this patient as part of the decolonization process before the surgery, they need to shower and use an antiseptic and antimicrobial agent to shower with. If our patients have restricted mobility, are they really able to shower and cleanse their body and particularly that surgical region appropriately? Or do they need adaptive equipment or assistance? We really need to emphasize with them to, to kind of not skimp in that area. Also, a lot of physicians are starting to um, utilize a preoperative nasal swab that's either going to be three months or some period of 30 days prior. They'll do a nasal swab for MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. That's one of the most common infections. And if the patient comes back positive, they're going to do a pre-op nasal ointment to try and decolonize to, again, help decrease the risk of an infection. So these are opportunities for our patient where we can contribute to the discussion and re enforcing their preoperative care, and it may not be something you included um, th or thought to include in your preoperative training. That surgical site infection, um, what they're statistically finding is that patients who have a greater BMI they're, and they're smokers, they have an increased risk of infection. Again, looking at our patients holistically, we have an opportunity if we can maybe in our preoperative training or even our patients with osteoarthritis where down the road they may need a total hip replacement to try and promote you know, smoking cessation, improved BMI uh, strategies, 
maybe referral out to other resources for assistance. They found in studies that even patients who stop smoking just those six to eight weeks prior to surgery, and they can have a significant decreased risk in wounds complications. And that is when they follow them even a year out postoperatively, that just that six to eight week uh, smoking cessation made a difference. So we have an opportunity there for our patients. Related to BMI, consider maybe in our, for our OA patients, as well as the pre-op training, maybe some type of aerobic conditioning or cardiovascular at a low level that doesn't damage the joint further, but that can help control that. BMI. Venal thromboembolism VTE, is um, the new terminology for uh, blood clots, uh, deep vein thrombosis, and pulmonary embolisms that develop. What they find is that uh, the low level of activity postoperatively um, combined with um, the surgical procedure that inside the lining of the um, blood ve vessel, this endothelial layer in here, that there's a little bit of damage to it. So we can see uh, platelet aggregation. We um, are finding that there's neutrophils that adhere to that damaged endothelial layer, and they're going to kind of create a matrix for the platelets to adhere, creating that blood clot so that um, DVT when it's attached. If that breaks off, that's going to travel up the inferior vena cava, up to the right side of the heart, go through the right side of the heart, and then lead to a potential pulmonary embolism for our patients. In terms of prevalence, they're finding that in about one in every 100,000 total knee replacements and one in every, no, in every 200,000 total hip replacements are going to have um, an embolism risk. In terms of minimizing the risk for patients, um, part of it they're just finding is the surgical procedure so that um, they're thinking that in patients who have total knee arthroplasties, there is more involvement of the smaller vasculature of the calf during the surgical procedure that places them at greater risk for that platelet aggregation compared to our total uh, hip replacement patients. When we're differentially diagnosing this postoperatively for the patient, we all know that we're monitoring our patients for that posterior calf pain and that swelling. We need to differentially um, diagnose. Could it be a spasm of the gastroc because they're pushing off and substituting with that during their gait? Is it intermittent claudication if they also have peripheral vascular disease? There are a lot of different things that can present as that deep vein thrombosis. Historically, we used the Homan sign to try and tell if it was a DVT. Well, what the research says, very definitively, multiple different studies, the Homan sign is out. <laughs> It is not, uh, you know, a clinically diagnostic tool to let us know if there is um, a DVT. The theory was that if this was my lower extremity, when I would extend the patient's knee and then I would dorsiflex their foot and then I palpate that calf, it is just going to uh, duplicate that pain because that knee extension with dorsiflexion, the gastroc is going to put tension on the underlying blood vessel and that pressure where the thrombus is would create pain. It is not specific. There's a low sensitivity for it. The new suggestion is to use Wells rule for DVT rule out. It's kind of a, a little bit of a complex um, analysis of the patient's history and um, their physical functioning. It's mathematically calculated, and then that is going to indicate if additional diagnostic testing should be utilized, maybe a Doppler ultrasound, to determine if a DVT is present. So this might be something those of you in acute care and home care or rehab working with patients uh, post-surgery, you want to familiarize yourself with the Rolls rule because it's the new um, standard that's utilized for predicting DVT 
in terms of managing DVT, what the research has found is while there are different equipment and you know protocols that can be utilized for medical management, the commonality among them is that the CPM does not help manage a DVT. It's a passive motion, so it's not going to play a role. What they've also discovered is that um, if there is not some type of compressive device used to replicate that venous return and muscular pump, the patient is at a greater risk. So really utilizing some type of a mechanical uh, compression device is necessary for patients. And this is based on multiple Co Cochrane reviews that have analyzed uh, the question. The different types of anti-embolism um, stockings and devices that can be utilized run the gamut. There are several different options. The stockings or TED hose on the left-hand side here that you may be aware of. Again, a different angle to think about with this. We know the patient has to wear it. Someone has to put it on. And I was educating a family member of a patient with Parkinson's disease, but it parallels this population with the um, challenges, she herself had arthritic changes in her hand and she was not a very strong and agile woman and she's trying to place these tattoos on her husband who is significantly taller than her. He had Parkinson's, who so is not very mobile and could assist, and she had a lot of trouble getting those stockings on. I actually found research studies that showed and then a significant number of uh, patients they analyzed who had the stockings applied that 54% of the cases actually created a reverse gradient. So instead of pushing the venous return, it was pulling it in the feet. So think about again in your family education, your patient education preoperatively, how are they going to get those stockings on? Do they need equipment to help them? You yourself, if you've ever tried putting them on, um, if you use uh, gloves, the vinyl exam gloves while you're applying them, it makes it a little easier to get them on and then adjust for the gradient. Compression devices are more commonly utilized in the acute care setting. There are many different types of compression devices and what they have found is um, the ones that kind of wrap around, like on the previous slide, they Velcro around the distal calf. They are going to compress and deflate in order to simulate that muscle pump. It shows good efficacy for total hip and knee replacement patients. They don't need to go above the knee for the hip. The calf seems to work. Um, something newer that they're utilizing are the rapid asymmetrical inflation devices. And the theory on those is that it's going to rapidly expand and rapidly deflate. And in doing so, they're seeing that there's an increased velocity of the blood flow through the blood vessel, and that helps limit the formation of the blood clot. First time I saw the little foot one, it looks like a little piece of fabric and it has thin tubes in it, and it goes on the uh, bottom plantar surface of the foot in order to stimulate the venous return. I was not a believer, so of course, what did I do? I went and I read some studies, and honestly, they're finding that by altering um, the circulation in the venous plexus of the plantar surface of the foot, that there are significant changes in the venous blood velocity in the distal lower extremity and combined with prophylaxis, it's shown to be beneficial in preventing those DVTs. So uh, something interesting there in the different types of equipment that are available.
surgical anesthesia going into the OR is going to play a role in how the patient is going to recover. We know general anesthesia, the patient is um, unconscious and they're going to have um, IV and inhaled analgesia utilized. There's more use uh, now and in the future, we're expecting to see greater use of more regional types of anesthesia for patients. Their regional means that is going to be isolated to the specific area of the body and that can come in the form of a peripheral nerve block where they're going to block the nerves in the extremity um, where the surgery is occurring or they're going to use some type of spinal or epidural in order to um, provide the anesthesia for the patient. In terms of complications from regional anesthesia, um, they're looking at from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons that there is little evidence to say that one type of anesthesia has less complications than other types. Looking at large cohort studies of almost 800, uh, sorry, of almost 8,000 um, patients, they are finding that patients who undergo um, general anesthesia they tend to have um, less one month mortality rates. So that is definitely helpful when they're considering looking at an elderly population. In terms of functional outcomes, they're really um, noticing that patients who undergo a regional anesthesia where some type of either epidural or nerve block is utilized in combination with the general anesthesia, that they seem to have better functional outcomes moving forward. And part of this may be related to the fact of the post-surgical pain management that some of those OR techniques provide even after the patient goes into recovery. The idea of post-operative acute pain management is focusing on decreasing the use of opioids. The push now is to really have alternative measures for our patients in terms of care. This is something that's utilized in Medicare um, reporting. They're finding that oral medications are primarily utilized, so they're encouraging exploration of other options for our patients. In terms of an area that we can play a role in encouraging those other um, positive outcomes postoperatively for pain, in 2017, there was a study done of 1,600 patients who had um, hip and knee arthroplasty, and they surveyed these patients at two weeks post-op and six months post-op. So they had no contact with the patients prior, so there was no bias here in the outcome. When they looked at patients who had no preoperative education on pain, they were not told that they would have pain, what kind of pain, how to manage it. They really received no information about pain. They found that 33% of those patients, they knew nothing going into surgery about their pain. Of those, 11% said, you know, I did get some education, but it was, didn't really help me at all after. When they looked at those patients, they actually found they had poor functional outcomes six months post-op. So that's significant for us. Just in education, kind of that mindset we know going in definitely plays a role for patients in terms of benefits post-operatively, not only in just the pain management, but also potentially in their function. So it seems like we have an early window here for improvement and for decreasing complications that may be utilized to overusage of pain medications. If we reinforce what to expect and how to manage their pain in our preoperative education. And that might be something as simple as educating them on positioning. For that total hip patient, maybe that recliner chair is the better place to sleep versus, you know, trying to get in and out of your bed. Or to let them know the side effects of the medication in terms of nausea and constipation so they're not panicked and concerned that something else is going wrong. Lots of different opportunities we have there. Looking at that anesthetic technique utilized during um, surgery for the patient, it can carry over to better pain relief postoperatively if they're using some kind of epidural or peripheral nerve block. 
You're likely to see patients with patient-controlled epidural anesthesia, the PCEA pump, when they come out of surgery. So it has the tube that is going to be inserted during surgery into the epidural space of the spine. And then the patient has a controller that they can click that will release a predetermined dosage. Why these are beneficial goes is through several different mechanisms. And this is where patient education comes into um, play. Number one, they can click that all they want, but it's going to max out at some point. So they don't have to worry about overdosing. Also, the patient is the one that needs to click that button before the pain is excruciating. The idea is that it's administration, so they should be pushing it, not us, not a family member, and to let them know that you have to manage the pain before it gets too intense so that you can be more functional to limit all these other potential complications from immobility. The idea is that the medication, because it's going into that epidural space, it's very close to the dorsal horn of our spinal cord, which is where our sensory and pain is going to be um, perceived. So the idea is that this medication is going to be so close to where our receptors are that it can be administered at a lower dosage to receive better benefits of pain blockage. Also, because it's absorbed into the cerebral spinal fluid, it can also be distributed more systemically to the patient's body for ongoing benefits. And they've also found that um, some of the medication is actually um, kind of like housed or retained in the region of the spinal cord. And it's almost like a little ongoing dosage over time that the body releases to itself for additional blockage of the pain in the patient's body. By having this local administration, it decreases those um, systemic effects of the constipation, nausea, and things of that nature, allowing the patient to have less side effects, hopefully improving mobility. Peripheral nerve block being utilized for hip and knee replacement. What happens is the physician is going to inject the nerve self, for example, a fem the femoral nerve uh, in a total knee replacement patient to give additional um, pain relief postoperatively. They say that it lasts somewhere between 12 and 48 hours postoperatively in terms of diminishing pain. But remember, the femoral nerve has both sensory and motor fibers, so that nerve is also going to have decreased signaling to the quads for strength. So we're going to be aware that you have to really check your quad strength in these patients for stability in those first 48 hours. They may have less quad control for um, balance. So looking at the stride and step with the opposite inoperative leg, they may not have the stability of the stance leg from those quads in addition to some pain to take a good stride. So just be, be mindful of that. Um, if your patient had a sciatic nerve block, for example, with a total hip arthroplasty, um, what they're finding is that can contribute to anterior tibialis uh, weakness. So you may be seeing decreased heel strike, more of a toe drag. So those patients are going to watch for fall risk because of not being able to clear those toes. In the future, they say we might start seeing more use of the saphenous nerve. That is a particular branch of the femoral nerve that only can carry sensory signals. So by just tackling that sensory part, we can have the benefit of pain relief without the risk of the decreased motor function. So it's really interesting. I love coming back to the anatomy of it. You know, remember all those things you had to memorize in school. Um, but that gives us our basis for understanding the surgical advances. And then really, when you have that patient post-op, it's going to let you make a better clinical decision and see how every hip and every every knee is really not, not the same. So we can have specificity in our rehab. Local infiltration analgesia is a newer technique the physicians are using, and it makes total sense. What they do during surgery is they're actually going to inject right here into the surrounding tissues during surgery um, the, an analgesic. They use different types. Again, it's a little bit different um, cocktail, but they'll do several different injections around the soft tissue surrounding the joint. And they're finding, the American Academy 
of orthopedic surgeons says that there's strong evidence that it actually is decreasing opioid use postoperatively because these um, kind of intra-articular injections are going right to the site of where the pain and the trauma may be for the patient to help control it for them. And this is really important, not only from the opioid use and potential complications, but they're seeing that because the patients have less pain, they have greater functional mobility postoperatively, shorter hospital length of stay, so decreasing that window of complications from immobility, and then it also leads to coughs cost savings. So we're seeing better pain ratings, uh, decreased narcotic use, and definitely better functional participation for these patients using that local infiltration analgesia. So when you look at those op reports, again, it might be something that'll just give you a little more insight to what's going on with your patient postoperatively. Therapy is something so simple that we utilize in rehabilitation that you may see some of your patients come out of the OR with either a cryocuff on that inflates and deflates and recirculates um, the cold water. Some physicians use ice packs after hip and knee replacements. Um, it's not only for pain management, but it's also looking at um, other factors. Potentially, some physicians feel that it may limit the blood loss because of the vasoconstriction. There's less blood loss and concern for the patient. There was a large study that was completed um, looking at, I think it was around 800 patients. They followed them for six months post-op their um, arthroplasty to try and see changes in pain rating. So they said the patients that received cryotherapy, like by day two, they had less pain, but by day three, the pain level was about the same as patients who did not receive the cryotherapy. So I guess theoretically it could help decrease length of stay and maybe range of motion. Um, they are seeing that be the case for total knee patients that receive um, the cryotherapy, that they had a greater increase of range of motion of knee flexion, about 11 degrees at post-op discharge than patients who did not receive the cryotherapy. Again, eventually they even out, but we may see more short-term gains because of that early pain management if you use the cryotherapy. The big question is to CPM or not to CPM? That is the question. I can tell you my career started out many months ago. We didn't touch the patient for at least two days after total joint replacement surgery. They were just in bed. Um, it's amazing now any of them survived and ever walked again, but I've seen it come then from I'm in the OR, you know, helping get CPM set up. And now we're at the point where some physicians are like, no, I don't even use it. So it runs the gamut, right? And even in your day-to-day, patient-to-patient, you're flipping it up. So what does the research say? Um, 
it's interesting. The American Academy of Orthopedic uh, Surgeons says there is very strong evidence that it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> so it really comes down to, again, the uh, physician's preference. Um, there was a 2014 Cochrane review, so that's where they go and they pull all the other research to look at it. They looked at 24 randomized controlled trials, um, you know, almost 1,500 patients, you know, CPM, no CPM, and controlling for all the variables. So one of the big uh, discussions is that, well, the CPM should improve knee flexion range of motion because the patient's relaxed, it's elongating the soft tissues, it should help increase range. And I can remember you how many times you in there saying, no, I got to increase it, try to relax. The studies found that maybe there's about a two degree increase in range of motion at post-op of patients who have the CPM versus not having the CPM. In terms of pain management, there was maybe a 4% decrease in pain in patients, um, which kind of equated to a very small um, amount in terms of statistical analysis. Um, looking at overall quality of life, following up and function, you know, down post rehab, they really weren't finding a significant difference. There was maybe only a point change on the Womack or some other functional scale. So it really is not uh, making a difference with or without the CPM. Um, where it does make a difference, it it seems from the research is that patient who's at a greater risk of adhesions of the knee postoperatively that might need that manipulation under anesthesia, they were finding that early CPM usage offset that a little bit. So maybe it has to do with the you know phase of healing and the fibroblast activity and tissue response that it helps, but again, not, not definitive. Ultimately, when we look at our overall clinical outcomes for our patients following um, arthroplasty of the hip and the knee, there are some tools out there if you want to see how you're doing compared to others and just where the rehab is taking us. Um, FORCE, which is Functional Outcome Research Comparative Effectiveness in Orthopedics. Whew, it's a mouthful. Um, basically what this is doing, it's um, physicians, orthopedic physicians and surgeons from all different um, hospitals. They enter all like the demographic, functional assessment, surgical outcome measures for their patients. And in 2015, they started entering all this data, and now it's kind of a resource to compare um, outcome data for different, different patients. Um, but they're finding when they look at all the different factors that can be associated with uh, patient performance following um, the arthroplasty, they're saying that there are so many different factors that are coming into play. And historically, there was concern that just being of an advanced age, our geriatric patient population, that they would have you know, less ultimate function and struggle more with pain. And they're really finding through all this data that that is not the case, that between the surgical techniques, the anesthesia, the post-surgical management, that we're really seeing positive outcomes for all the different patients. So there's still, you know, I said, need to be some variables that we can look at and factors to consider to try and move towards the best possible outcomes for our patients. So a couple things that I looked at, particularly for patients with total hip um, arthroplasty, there was a study that followed patients over a course of three years post total hip uh, arthroplasty. It was large cohort, 1,300 patients, so some, some good data looking at the benefits of PT and OT for this particular population. And they found that the stronger the quads were for knee extension preoperatively, the better postoperative strength um, the patient was able to achieve. So particularly if the patient had strong quads on that um, involved side, that they had better postoperative um, gait and improved overall outcomes. So when you're goal setting for your patients with osteoarthritis or preoperatively coming up with your plans, really focusing on that quads, we know that it may be painful based on joint compression, um, but, but trying to increase that strength as much as possible.
when you look at different assessment tools, and we'll talk about a couple of them specifically, the Harris HIP score uh, seems to be a good indicator of the risk of revision. So maybe looking at the various components of that assessment tool and trying to decrease the preoperative score will help with that particular patient uh, postoperatively. Factors that are associated with poor outcomes, um, there's a general consensus that psychological state does play a role for the patient and as well as the pain levels that they have coming into surgery, which we kind of know that we need to address that already for our patients. The angle that I want to take with it is consider those preoperative modifiable risk factors because patients sometimes with osteoarthritis, they feel like there's nothing to do about it, right? They've tried therapy, they've tried supplements, they've tried this, they've tried that, and nothing works, right? I have to resort to surgery. Well, there are other factors that we've discussed so far today that do play a role and that are modifiable, that maybe we can incorporate some goals or patient education related to them. We said stopping um, smoking, the tobacco use, because it will impair healing. Looking at the physical deconditioning specifically, um, if you're using the TUG score for patients, because we do have concerns about fall risk for this population, they do find that a preoperative TUG of less than 10 seconds um, led to the patient not needing a device sooner after surgery. So if you can get that tug score preoperatively to improve better balance and speed and um, direction change, they, things like that, they're finding that for a total hip replacement six months out, those patients with those stronger tug scores um, used no device sooner. They had better balance. Looking at uh, nutrition for our patients and considering obesity from a holistic percentage, uh, perspective, looking at populations with osteoarthritis, um, patients who were able to lose 11 pounds. So percentage-wise of their body weight, it varied for the patient, but it would happen to be a female group. If they lost um, about 11 pounds, they had a 50% decrease in their OA symptoms. So that is pretty significant for pre-op management. Looking at this population um, post-op, this means that they're at a l lower risk of loosening and infections if we have an improvement in that um, body weight. Looking at ranges for BMI, patients who are over 30 BMI in terms of their obesity seem to be at that greater risk of complications postoperatively. Um, they seem to use an assistive device for longer. They have increased risk of uh, falling, and that's attributed to more challenges that they just have because of their you know, biomechanics and their size with uh, transitions and quick movements. So maybe looking at strengthening those transitions and educating prior. In addition, if you can play a role in referring to other sources or maybe some low level non-traumatic to the joint aerobic conditioning, cardiovascular conditioning that may help modify the obesity um, prior. Other musculoskeletal comorbidities that seem to impact patient outcomes uh, post-operatively. Um, in 2013, there was a study analyzing patients um, uh, involved in uninvolved limbs, which is kind of hard to say, right, with osteoarthritis because it changes what the, the good is when they have surgery, you don't have surgery, or maybe day, day to day. But what they find is patients who underwent a total knee arthroplasty, um, that is about 30% of them have arthritis and pain and weakness in the opposite lower extremity and their low back. And they're finding a slightly higher percentage going up closer to 40% of patients with total hip have associated pathology in those areas. So we might wanna be mindful of that during our rehabilitation, maybe our ADL training for our patients, adaptive equipment to try and minimize the stress on those other joints while they're healing so that we can improve function also postoperatively. The different rehab measures that we utilize are vast. There are so many to um, choose the, 
for our patients. We typically look at strength, range of motion, pain for our patients. But we also want to consider the use of patient reported outcome measures, PROMs, during the course of the patient's therapy. You should be using at least one of those to get some uh, patient feedback and really look at outcome assessment. So we're going to review a couple that are commonly utilized, not only in research, but also clinically for progress with hip and knee. The WOMAC, Western Ontario McMaster University's Arthritis Index. That's a mouthful. Uh, WOMAC's much easier. This is um, going to look at a combination of patient self-assessment of pain, stiffness, as well as their uh, physical functioning. And it's going to uh, be very valid as well as it has a high sensitivity uh, to change in health status. So this is beneficial to get some outcome measures for our patients. It is going to uh, allow you to look at the patient's scoring in these different areas. And they have a Likert scale. So, the scale, so they say for each different function, uh, functional task or level of pain, it's going to have them say, well, is it mild, moderate? severe or extreme and then it's a calculation higher scores indicate uh, more compromise in the different areas this is a score uh, tool that can be utilized pre-op as well as post-op for improvements and it's also beneficial not only just for your patients with osteoarthritis but fibromyalgia lupus RA things like that the short form uh, SF12 is kind of a combination tool looking not only at those physical indicators of arthritis and post-operative arthropathy, pain, and motion. It's going to expand that to consider not only the physical function, but also the social role and how it's limiting the patient's life. Because again, that um, you know psychological status, expectation piece, it really comes into play for patients in terms of recovery. It's going to look at things like emotional challenges, psychological stress. So it has a lot of different um, questions. And what this one does is it calculates a score and then you compare it to normative data. So if you have greater than 50, it says that you have you know, better physical or mental health than the normative, less than 50, it is worse. So again, it could be something that you can look at for your patient as an improvement compared to themselves also. The KSS is the Knee Society score. This was actually implemented or developed, I should say, in 1989. And then they had to revise it in 2011 because um, they found that, you know, the more contemporary patient had different expectations. And that is one of the areas that's assessed on this particular tool. So this tool is interesting because it's going to look at those physical presentation and function, you know, how far can you walk, what is your pain and range of motion, but here's where it differs. It's going to not only add patient satisfaction, you know, how satisfied with your ability to clean your house. Well, I'd never be satisfied, but that's not because of my knee. But, but it's also going to add patient expectations pre and post and questions about that. So it kind of lets us know where the patient's coming from and where their specific expectations met. And the physician will also use a component of this with radiologic findings. So it's kind of really a broad-based tool that can be utilized. Um, things like how long can you stand before you sit? Um, and again, looking at those pre and post-op expectations, and then some versions even include sport and recreation. So this can be a broad reaching assessment tool that you utilize. The knee um, injury or osteoarthritis outcome score, the COOS, this is a tool that is um, really focusing on patient opinion. It is a common tool utilized for patients postoperatively with um, knee arthroplasty. It's going to ask them questions like, um, do you have difficulty with tasks on a flat surface? Um, are you having difficulty, uh, you know, going shopping or kneeling? What's your pain with bed mobility? But then it's also going to ask questions looking at that quality of life component. And this is where it becomes really beneficial too for this 
patient assessment um, piece for their opinion, it's going to say, have you had to modify your life because of your knee pathology? Um, how much are you troubled by it? So it gives you a score up to 100. And, um, you know, the higher the score, the more severe the, the symptoms. Um, so, sorry, opposite. Uh, the higher the score, the less the symptoms because it's better function. And this is going to really be utilized. It's really recommended by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons as the tool of choice following knee arthroplasty to get some good information of the patient performance and also their sense of, of well-being. So the COOS is something you want to utilize. They make one for the hip. While it's not the primary recommended tool for the hip, it's equivalent in order to assess the patient um, impact on quality of life as well as function with following their total hip arthroplasty. It has been validated. Um, it seems to be more responsive than the Womack for the hip, they say. So if you're deciding between the two, the recommendation is to go with this. And it also retains that good inter intra tester um, reliability. There's no specific normal value like the other one. It's more looking at a change for that particular patient. The Harris HIP score is another older tool. It was developed in 1969. It's a, still utilized because it's a nice, quick, takes about five minute assessment tool with excellent um, reliability. They actually had physicians and physical therapists um, utilize the score on this tool on the same patient and it had good intertester um, reliability. Actually, it had excellent, they said. This particular tool is the recommendation or gold standard, as they say, for use with our total hip patients because of the good efficacy that it has. It is going to have the patient rate their pain function as well as the joint mobility. And this is a tool that they recommend you could use pre as well as post-op for your patient. Um, so maybe it's something they complete during that preoperative training. And then if you get the opportunity to follow that same patient or you're looking at indicators across the continuum of care for your organization. Um, there was a long-term study that followed the patient's pre and, and post-op, and the majority of them did indicate improvements in various aspects of this uh, scoring tool. When we look at what should the change be, it tends to vary. Generally speaking, when we say the minimally clinically important difference, that means how much of a change in the score has to happen to say it really changed and made a positive benefit. For this particular tool, the Harris HIP score, they're saying that an improvement of 16 to 18 points is minimally clinically important. And if you can have your patient have a 40% 40 point improvement, that that's considered a moderate improvement. 
aspect that comes into this by looking at function, we are getting some information on patient satisfaction. Generally speaking, what all the research has found is that uh, the majority of patients are satisfied with their hip and knee arthroplasty. Somewhere between 80 and 88 percent it seems to be the number that they're hitting on, and patients are reporting improvements in um, function as well as pain. Dissatisfaction also tends to be related to pain and particularly with the uh, kneeling and descending stairs, so those deeper bending type activities, uh, if there was something that they said they weren't completely satisfied with. In terms of mod managing that post-surgical uh, pain, we talked about previously looking at chronic pain for the patients. It's going to be multimodal. Um, there are going to be different aspects of management. Generally, we say that patients somewhere between 3 and 12 months, they should have full recovery of their pain. And after a patient is considered completely healed from their surgery, if they have chronic pain for greater than three months beyond when the physician says they're completely healed, then it falls under this umbrella of uh, chronic pain. Something to consider for patients at that point when we're looking at chronic pain, we're going to be considerate of that theory of central sensitization. What happens is because the patient had the osteoarthritis for many years prior to surgery, that dorsal horn, uh, those dorsal horn neurons, are, they have had compete ongoing continuous stimulation of those nociceptors, creating those uh, painful inputs that are recognized by the brain. It then becomes kind of like a combination of a psychological as well as a physical problem because preoperatively the patient knew, had pain, they knew they would have pain, they would move less. If they tried to move, then they would have more pain and they kind of get in that vicious cycle. So consider with your total joint Replacement, replacement patients, that some of them may actually turn into a chronic pain patient, which would shift your management uh, of them, which would be a whole other course. <laughs> Patients who report um, that anterior hip pain following total hip arthroplasty, in rare cases, sometimes they can have a shifting of the acetabular component. Um, or not a shift, it could, it could sometimes be, they say, the way that it was aligned during surgery. So if you have that total hip replacement patient who's presenting with symptoms of an iliopsoas tendonitis, so pain with that resisted hip flexion, kind of that anterior um, groin pain, that iliopsoas is originating the iliacus portion in the iliac fossa, and then it's coming down to insert here on the um, femur. Well, what happens is if with the anterior, with, with the cup of the acetabulum, if we look at the image to the right, if this cup is tilted with the bottom lip kind of tilting forward and sticking out, you can see how that would rub here, right here, on that posterior aspect of the iliopsoas. And when you resist that hip flexion, it digs in. And anytime they try to use the hip flexion, it kind of replicates those tendonitis type symptoms. So something to be aware of. Again, if you have a concern about that, it would mean referral back to the physician for um, further analysis and management. Preoperatively, let's go back in time now, there are things that we can also look at to try and help improve all of these post-op outcomes. The new terminology is prehab. It's been called many, many things over time. Um, historically, we focused on exercise to strengthen the patients, mobility. How are you going to use that walker? How are you going to get up the stairs? What adaptive equipment do you need? Pick up all the rugs from your home. Here are the precautions, the things you can't do. All beneficial, but we were more mobility-based. What they found when looking at patients who received preoperative um, 
training before their total hip replacement. The Cochrane study pulled 18 other trials, 1,500 participants, and they looked at how effective was the preoperative training in terms of postoperative indicators. So we would think, because we focus on function and preop training, that it would significantly increase function postoperatively compared to po patients that didn't receive it. Well, that wasn't the case. They really found that preoperative training had very little impact on anxiety, pain, function, health-related quality of life, and adverse events. So while we were diligent and well-intentioned, we were not as effective in some of these indicators. So the decision was it was really unsure if it offers benefits versus patients not receiving from us clinicians pre-training. Things that should be incorporated, now they're saying, in preoperative education to kind of target the different areas of patient expectation, patient pain levels and complications, is that those should really be the areas that we should focus our patient education, that we need to look at improving, in particular, patient awareness and patient expectations. You know, right? Kind of look at it that they're a consumer. So we need to let them know. And we're finding that when these areas are incorporated, they're seeing less anxiety in the patient, um, a decrease in hospital length of stay because they have better pain management and better function afterwards also. So things to consider in educating your patient that I've kind of sprinkled throughout our presentation today. When we look at that symptom management, something that you want to consider is that pain piece, because it is important to manage pain and it's important for patients to understand. And what a lot of them don't recognize is that relationship between pain, mobility, and nausea. They are going to be nauseous postoperatively because of the anesthesia. So they may need antiemetics, maybe educate them on that. Most of the physicians, it's in the standing order, but the patient needs to know to ask for it. They just don't need to think the nausea is normal or be concerned that it's something more. Um, so they need to communicate with the nursing staff and their physician. Because if they are nauseous, when you have pain, it is natural to become nauseous when you have significant pain. Again, educate them on this. So they're, if they have pain, they're nauseous, they move less, it kind of becomes this vicious um, triangle of interaction. So we need to educate our patients on the importance of taking the pain medication for the benefits, that mobility will ultimately help, and that some nausea is to be expected, but there are ways to manage it. All of this comes into patient empowerment, letting them know beforehand that there are things they can do that can help improve their outcomes and modify 
the course of treatment that they have postoperatively. There was an interesting study um, that was done where they took patients in, in Australia and they gave them a DVD preoperatively with all of these different um, kind of relaxation techniques, self-confidence, how to manage your emotions, um, what are normal or expected uh, realistic expectations. They did things like uh, music therapy with them um, in the DVD, visualization, and what they actually found by teaching the patients these strategies uh, preoperatively, that postoperatively, the patients um, had more positive outcomes. So when you're looking at those patients and your goals for your pre-op training, relaxation techniques may be something to consider including that may help some patients. Building their self-confidence, kind of that mental preparation of actually what to expect, what is it going to be like, maybe having some someone come in and talk about it that's been through it from their perspective. Other ideas to consider your preoperative management. Because postoperatively, we are going to see these patients and we are going to um, get them moving. And what's important, the noting with early postoperative mobilization, getting the patients up and moving soon after surgery, it definitely has an improvement in pain, function, um, ultimate quality of life. It's definitely beneficial to get them moving early because it also decreases hospital length of stay, which can decrease potential. Um, complicating factors. Physical therapy day of surgery, like I said, I came from the day where you way back when didn't touch the patient, but I've also seen patients hours after surgery. And what they found is that mobilizing the patient, it seems like 24 hours postoperatively is the idea within the first 24 hours, they should be up and moving. Now I want you to consider if your patient had surgery 8 a.m. yesterday and it was a hip, today you probably saw your knees first if they had to go in the CPM and then you saw your hips. So depending on what time that patient had surgery yesterday, you're outside of your 24-hour window with them. So bear in mind that you may have missed your opportunity for early mobilization. So this might be kind of a scheduling strategy point in your clinic to know what time different patients came out of surgery if you really want to maximize these benefits. And they say that even if you can't get the patient up and actually walking because of their status within that 24 hours, at least get them sitting and moving and have that first attempt at getting up within those 24 hours from surgery. In terms of day of surgery, those patients love us, right? They're actually finding that overall it can make a difference between a half a day and 48 hours in terms of their hospital length of stay. That it does seem to show an improvement if they have surgery or they have mobility uh, post-op day one, if the physician in your facility is open to that. Um, it can make a significant improvement within those first four to six hours if we get them up and moving. 
when you are getting them up and moving early on, you want to consider, like we said, if they did have that femoral nerve block, that uh, they will have more significant weakness in the quads. So our risk of fall is increased. Also, they're still coming out of the anesthesia. And with that hip replacement, you're going to be checking your orders. Your cemented hips will likely have earlier weight bearings, so that may make that early mobilization a little bit easier. In terms of what we can accept or expect, I should say, for range of motion goals for the patient um, with a total uh, knee replacement, it really does tend to change in that acute care phase. Um, the standard was always you should get them 90 degrees by the time they're discharged from the hospital. I pulled so many different studies, and this chart reflects kind of what I was able to find as the norms. So usually they're at 90 degrees at minimum, uh, hopefully sooner by week two, 100 by week four, and one 120 by 8, and some may go up to that 150 based on the design of their implant. If you're looking at the outcomes for total hips, we tend to think more about strength, particularly of abduction and extension for those patients for functional stability. The, it kind of varies whether the anterior or the posterior approach um, were stronger. It seems like initially the patients with the anterior approach because of less disruption of the tissues are doing better functionally and are stronger, but it seems to kind of even out as we go further out in rehab. Aquatic therapy, just to mention, if you are utilizing that for your patients, um, I'm here in Florida, so I had to have a slide on it, um, that they are finding that it does have an improvement for patients in terms of their outcome, that you can do good strengthening, particularly of knee extension and hip abduction, and you have the benefit of the buoyancy to decrease the compressive load. You know, you can do lunges and squats and all types of different activities um, for the patient. And they found that some patients may have greater range of motion achieved with aquatic therapy. The concern is that infection risk. So you have to check with the physician in terms of, you know, somewhere between four days and two weeks, our staples are still in and the incisions are still healing. So the patient would need an occlusive dressing, but you're going to need to check with your physician on that. Overall effectiveness of us as clinicians, uh, physical therapy from uh, a 2015 meta-analysis of 1,700 patients in 18 studies. We do make a difference in total knee arthroplasty compared to no therapy, um, which is great. Looking at occupational therapy um, indications for the patient, that, a, that training in the adaptive equipment they found is so important preoperatively as well as post postoperatively, that overall training the patients in how to use their adaptive equipment allowed them to have uh, more beneficial outcomes. And athletic trainers, you kind of fit in there as our mix of contributing to uh, benefits in strengthening and rehab for our patients. We all have a role to play in improving our patients with uh, total hip arthroplasty. We find that there are many different considerations that we have in patient management, going from surgical to post-surgical to rehab, and I hope I covered them for you today to give you some different things to think about. So someone's asking the question, how prevalent is the procedure that spares both the ACL and the PCL? I didn't see any specific uh, data on that. Um, just some mention that in younger patients where those ligaments are intact, that they are able to uh, utilize that procedure. But it, because it's a more technically demanding procedure on the physician end, there's a greater learning curve. It just didn't seem that the um, training and the prosthetic options are out there yet to, for it to be widely utilized. So I'd say it's a question to ask the physicians that you work with to see after we go through all this exactly which type of prosthetic component they're using, because it will give you some input as to why different patients are responding differently during rehab. Because for those patients where both are replaced, you will see um, they're saying improved proprioceptive awareness.
So, uh, could I go over or explain the PCL stabilizing effect to stop the gliding of the tibia on the femur? So, um, when a patient goes in, no, oh, here's my knee. When a uh, patient goes in to, let's say they're standing and they're squatting, they go into a deep knee bend type of position. At this point, um, the PCL here is functioning to stop that posterior translation, let's see, posterior translation of the tibia on the femur. Uh, I can't show you, let's see if I can get a view here. This, this PCL here we can see is elongating and it's going to check or stop this tibia from gliding posteriorly on the femur. So what they found is, and I'll talk more about this um, with femoral rollback, is that without that PCL there, that the prosthetic itself has to be built so that when the femoral component rolls back, it locks in place with the polyethylene on the, um, the projection on the tibial component liner so that we don't get that rollback. Question is, what happens to the MCL and the LCL? Most of the references that I read say that those ligaments are going to remain intact. If we look here at the anterior view of the knee, the um, lateral collateral ligament, see it's originating up here, it's actually originating um, proximal to the articular surface, and then the lateral is over here on the fibula, so that is not impacted uh, necessarily with the arthritis. And then medially here, again, it's up here a little closer to the epicondyle of the um, medial femoral, and then it's attaching down here all the way up on the let's say, inferior to the plateau of the tibia. So essentially those ligaments are not impacted um, with that same deterioration that occurs with our ACL and PCL in that synovium. So oftentimes they're able to retain those ligaments for stability of the valgus and varum. And again, as arthritis impacts joints, we do tend to see a genu valgus or varum based on how the surfaces are deteriorating. So the physician is going to attempt to restore that normal alignment with the prosthetic components through the, the shaving and alignment. And then they're going to test the integrity of the ligaments in order to provide some stability to the joint and then address the tendons of the surrounding musculature also to make sure there's the right tension in all those structures so that they can provide some stability to the joint. So the question is, is it common for the pezanserine bursa to become inflamed with the medial approach? So on the total knee replacement um, with that medial approach coming down the patellar tendon, I can see your concern with the pezanserine bursa in that area. The studies that I looked at didn't reference that. Um, doesn't mean it's not the case. It's not something I was specifically looking for, but it wasn't mentioned. Um, I would definitely say that's something to consider in your different diagnosis, that peasant serene bursitis uh, for the patient, um, that medial kind of anterior knee pain couldn't be the meniscus because that no longer exists for the patient. So that might be a consideration in your uh, differential diagnosis. Um, so someone saying that for the patients that they are seeing in the skilled nursing setting who are confused that uh, physicians are opting for the anterior approach for safety. And that's where uh, the physician choosing what's most appropriate given all the circumstances for the patient comes into play. That anterior approach does not have the precaution of dislocation in the deep sitting position. 
um, which is where what happens a lot with um, different, uh, you know, toileting, dressing, things like that, um, with that deep hip flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. So you're right, sometimes the physician will choose that anterior approach because they're forward thinking in terms of the precaution and the function for the patients. And also they've not disrupted the hip abductors, which are important for stability of that hip joint, particularly during single limb stance and gait. So it may, um, when we say safer, it may mean that there are not the same precautions for the patient to have. There's less disruption of the soft tissue, so there's greater strength in that early post rehab. So we may see better outcomes for those patients um, who undergo that anterior replacement. Someone's asking why is the patient's main or common complaint anterior hip and groin? pain with a uh, posterior approach. Um, the research hasn't specifically explained that. We are finding that for um, some patients, they are um, experiencing a little more of a lateral anterior hip pain if there's a nicking of a particular nerve during the surgical procedure, um, and then it's just responding to that trauma. Um, typically, the hip does refer pain anterior medially, so it might just be part of that preoperative pain pattern. Um, I apologize, but I haven't come across anything specific explaining that more in depth from a research perspective. Uh, the age range for the younger population in all the studies. I am interested in that myself since I, I fall in different points based on the study. Um, they really varied. In some studies, they said younger was under 55. Um, in others, they used 65. I have to say it really did vary. Um, generally speaking, I would say younger tended to be under 50. But you really have to go back and look at each study. Question is, did you find any gap in the literature regarding um, psychology of pre- and post-op patients? Most of the literature that I read was looking at the fact that patients seem to say, particularly related to pain, that they just didn't know what to expect or that they didn't have any pre-op education on anything or what they were told really didn't help manage their anxiety. So the research seemed to just be leaning towards that, you know, just doing education, kind of putting information out there isn't helpful, that it needs to be more targeted towards those psychological concerns that the patient has. And once we do that, maybe we can see more of an impact in terms of benefit of that preoperative training. Um, so the question is, do we have any research on uh, the stem cells with osteoarthritis? Uh, that is not something that I explored for this course that is still emerging. Um, maybe it's something I'll look at in the future, but I specifically didn't analyze that, and it was not something mentioned in that study um, significantly um, from the major organizations, so I think that research is still emerging. Um, does it mean, what does it mean if you have a click or clunk in your knee but have not had any surgery? That requires a lot of differential diagnosing, right? Uh, the knee is very complex, as is uh, many of the other joints that we manage. And there are so many factors that can come into play in terms of special tests that we need to analyze. If you have access to the radiographic imaging, um, you know, when the patient has the pain, that's almost a course in and of itself, and I, I apologize, I can't give you a specific answer for that. Um, we know that some patients who have osteoarthritis do present with crepitus, which is more of a grinding, uh, not a click or a clunk per se. Uh, 
Uh, so the question is on uh, results with cortisone injections. It is something that has been mentioned in the research um, to manage osteoarthritis for patients um, and try to control that inflammatory process that they're presenting with at different phases. I didn't specifically come across anything that um, discussed the results at the different phases, but it is something that is mentioned in the literature as one of the options for conservative management in order to um, try to push off the time before the patient needs a joint replacement. So someone's asking how much uh, flexion range of motion is expected from the unicompartmental arthroplasty. Um, there weren't specific research studies that looked at the actual degrees for that. Um, Theoretically, from what I can surmise, is because the ligaments are still intact and you're not completely changing the mechanics of the joint, you should expect significant range of motion. Um, some of the total knee arthroplasties now, you can get up to 150 degrees, which is normal full range of motion. So I would think you should be able to achieve uh, close to normal range for the patient. Um, but again, there weren't specific studies that have analyzed that yet. And I feel bad that I can't give specific answers to a lot of these questions. Um, just to create a three-hour course, I had to restrict myself a little bit um, in, in the research. Uh, the question is that uh, someone's pharmacist suggested uh, glucosamine, not chondroitin, with the hyaluronic acid um, for osteoarthritis, saying that there's some research that's effective. The research that I pulled, I just went straight to the source that American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons in conjunction with the other um, authors, and what they said were those particular items individually were not showing benefit for patients to actually utilize them. Now that's not to say that since they published that study, it's been you know about two, two years now, that things haven't changed. Um, so there may be more current research, but what I would suggest is go back to the, that same resource. In um, the, my presentation at the end, I have all the references for everything uh, that I utilized. So maybe go back, it was a huge report go back in and see if they have anything that they've updated on that. Um, but from the part that I read, their recommendation was that those items individually, the research wasn't supporting, but research is changing constantly. So someone's saying that they're seeing patients with anterior lateral approach that are being provided with posterior hip precautions. And this is where the surgery is amazing that things continue to change. As of now, posterior approach total hip seems to be the most common. Anterior approach seems to be utilized by some physicians um, because it does allow for earlier mobility and they seem to be easier precautions for some patients because they don't have to avoid that hip flexion adduction position. But the po anterior lateral approach, I have not encountered myself yet. That might be a new way that they're kind of combining the benefits of both to have sufficient exposure as well as uh, looking at tissue trauma. Uh, so that one, I did not see any research on. If it's emerging technique, what happens is when I'm writing these evidence-based courses, if there's not evidence, I, I don't specifically speak to it. So again, something that maybe is on the horizon. Um, I've seen a lot of variation in precautions for the uh, anterior lateral hip replacements. Do you find a lot of surgeons have a wide range of post-operative precautions? Physicians definitely, once they get in there, remember these patients, they may not just be undergoing a total hip replacement or depending on their anatomical structure and the deterioration, maybe the physicians had to do, uh, you know, an osteotomy or maybe they had to do a tenotomy and reattach and move different structures. Maybe there's been tearing of different tendons that had to be sutured back. So looking at the operative report, if possible, may account for some of these different precautions and restrictions that you're seeing on your patient postoperatively. 
In terms of how long typically should we observe total hip precautions, that again is up to the physician. It will depend on the stability, the approach. Um, it really has changed over time. There was no set recommendation on how long total hip precautions should be followed. Uh, you mentioned 20 to 30 year time for longevity. When I started therapy, it was said that the replacement will last 10 to 15 years. Has it changed that much? I can say when I first started, they were saying about 10 to 15 years too. And yes, the research is currently supporting that at that 15 year mark, over 80% are still, um, the 80% survivorship, they call it, still functional prostheses. And then when they're able to follow some of those patients out to the 20 to 30 year mark, which again, we're kind of just starting to reach that 30 year mark with some of these patients, um, that they are still seeing the big term good survivorship for the patients. So the newer prosthetic components, newer surgical techniques, the anticipation is it will be longer, but not enough years have passed for them to prove that yet.